talk to you about today, time permitting, we'll see how far we get into this, is uh, framed by the following question, which is what has the brain evolved to know about the natural olfactory world? And um, I, you know, before I start, I want to say that I'm mindful of something that I think was well put by the early 20th century biologist Max Delbruck, um, who, whose dictum was, imagine that your audience has zero knowledge but infinite intelligence. And so I think this may be a crowd uh, for which uh, both of those things may be true, at least vis-a-vis -vis, um, uh, some of the neuroscience I'm going to talk about. Many of you are not biologists. Um, actually, I, I don't know how close we are to infinite intelligence and zero knowledge. How many people here are biologists? Raise your hand if you're a biologist. That's the zero intelligence. That's the zero intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. And I understand a lot of people here are um, mathematicians, they have a background in math. My husband actually um, <coughs> Uh, uh, used to be a mathematician. He's now a biologist. Before he was a mathematician, he was a philosopher. Um, actually, he, when he got into biology, he was appalled by just how much trash and garbage is uh, consumed by the average biology lab. You know, lots of petri dishes and things like that, paper towels. And he said, it's really horrific. He said, you know, when I was a mathematician, all we needed was um, just a pen and paper and a wastebasket. And when I was a philosopher, we didn't even need the wastebasket. <laughs> Just in the audience, let me apologize and say that um, much of what I'm going to talk about today is, uh, are things that you've already heard, things you already know and you'll find in many textbooks, and they're not original to me. Um, toward the end, I'll try to talk about a few thoughts that may be slightly original, but those are not big ideas, those are more small ideas. Um, I'm going to regard this mainly as a time to just um, talk to the uh, non-biologists in the audience, and I want to lay out a few claims I'm going to make, and, and you can tell me whether or not you're persuaded of these at the end. Um, I'm going to argue to you that the world of sensory stimuli exhibits consistent statistical regularities. And this is something that we need to know about if we study the way the brain encodes sensory stimuli. Um, I'm going to argue that the brain has evolved um, and or developed during the lifetime of an organism to take advantage of these statistical regularities. And that's in part what we as sensory neuroscientists And this can get you, you certainly we don't know. Pardon? That's a kind of presumption, we certainly don't know. We don't not. know. I'm going to argue to yeah. you. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I'm going to argue also that the brain's statistical predictions are embodied in part in antagonistic interactions among neurons within the same brain region. And finally, I'm going to argue that we can infer what statistics matter to an organism by investigating its brain. And so I'm going to use the first portion of this talk to lay out some fundamental principles and ideas, some of which are a little bit controversial, but I think most of which are taken um, for granted by most sensory neuroscientists. That's going to be sort of background knowledge from your perspective. And then toward the end, I'll um, ask the question of whether these principles generalize from vision, which is a sensory modality in which they've been studied in greatest detail, to olfaction, which is a very different kind of sensory modality, and that requires a different way of thinking and a different way of um, doing neuroscience. Uh, so, I think it should be pretty self-evident that the world of sensory stimuli exhibits some statistical regularities. If you consider a typical uh, visual image like this one, um, it should be pretty obvious that nearby pixels tend to be highly correlated. Right? The luminance of one pixel tends to be much like the luminance of another pixel. And where that breaks down is at the edges of the image, but those are you know, the minority of pixels in the image. Um, these are statistical regularities in space, but we can also think about statistical <coughs> regularities in time. Um, and so just as low spatial frequencies predominate, um, uh, low temporal frequencies predominate, so if we focus on a region of um, a movie like this, something like a natural scene, and look at different frames over time, you see one frame tends to be much like the next. Um, in other words, you see these low frequency temporal correlations in visual stimuli, as well as spatial correlation. And I think uh, you know, these are two aspects of natural statistical regularities. I want to just bring up a third one that I think you don't hear people talk about quite as much, but I think is equally important when you think about the structure and function of neural circuits. And that's that uh, sensory stimuli vary widely in intensity. Um, so just to give you a sense of what this means concretely, let's think about envision what um, particularly dim or bright natural visual stimuli might be. They differ in their absolute intensity by um, something like seven orders of magnitude. Uh, natural auditory stimuli differ in their intensity 
in something like, again, six, maybe seven orders of magnitude. This is incredible dynamic range when you think about the energy that's involved and that has to be transmitted to sensory <coughs> organs. And when you think about how circuits have to deal with these extremely wide variations in the energy that's delivered to them, you start to um, appreciate the problem that sensory systems um, face. They have to operate in this huge dynamic range. So these, I would say, are the three basic statistical regularities that confront any sensory system. Um, so let me is just... It, is it a coincidence that in both cases it's about seven orders of magnitude? I think it is roughly coincidental, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we don't actually know the dynamic range of olfaction. Um, uh, largely, I mean, it's limited um, at the top by um, sort of the vapor pressure of an undiluted chemical, but it's limited at the bottom, we don't know. We don't actually know how many molecules need to be captured um, by the olfactory system in order for uh, us to smell something. Yeah. Um, okay, so before I go on, I need to tell those of you in the audience who are not neuroscientists a few uh, there are facts about neural circuits so we can all be on the same page. Um, so here's some fun facts. Um, one, uh, sensory stimuli are encoded in the brain by um, ensembles of neurons. So not single neurons, but groups of neurons working together. And each of these neurons is selective in the sense that um, each neuron in the sensory brain region is quote unquote looking for something in the environment and it's not responding non-selectively to everything. And what it's looking for, uh, we call its receptive field. So if a stimulus causes a neuron to change its pattern of activity, we say that stimulus is within the receptive field of that neuron. <coughs> and these neurons are also in, um, organized in hierarchies. But it's not biochemically what the difference, because they, and they change neurons. What biochemically happens to, for one neuron to, to, to develop a particular receptive field? I see. Um, right, so uh, what specifies a neuron's receptive field is an interesting question. Um, for a neuron that's um, in the sensory periphery, it can be as simple as where that neuron is located, right? So a cutaneous mechanoreceptor on my finger will have a receptive field on my finger, right? For a neuron in the cortex, say high up in the brain's processing hierarchy, um, the, uh, there are also neurons that are selective for stimuli on my finger, but that would be a function of the connectivity of brain circuits. So what neurons connect to what other brain neurons? So that neuron in my cortex would receive input ultimately and directly from neurons in my finger. Um, now there are also biochemical differences between neurons that confer selectivity on them. So different photoreceptors express different molecules that um, capture photons of different wavelengths. That's a biochemical difference. Is it possible to move one piece of brain to another and see if it actually depends on location rather than on in internal properties of neurons? How much uh, you can be rely on what you say? Yeah, that's an interesting that. question, right? Um, so, I mean, fundamentally, where a neuron is doesn't matter. What matters is who it's connected to and what molecules um, it expresses on its surface, right? Um, the, you know, neurons in the periphery tend to be endowed with selectivity by virtue of their molecular expression. Neurons in the central uh, nervous system tend to be. Um, <coughs> conferred with uh, selectivity based on their connectivity. But their intrinsic properties, um, say the electrical properties of those cells, also contribute to their selectivity. No, but I think by now, no, it's by the level of ventilation of DNA, we have a lot of protein sitting there to say, are two neurons different, right? Now it can be decided how <laughs> yeah. much they, they differ. But for the same function, for different functions, what is that can Just looking at individual neurons, looking at what's sitting in DNA, can you tell that from this part of that part of the cortex? Uh, in some cases, yes, in some cases, no. I mean, neurons are actually remarkably diverse in their morphology yeah. and the genes they express. And so large branches of neuroscience are concerned with trying to understand the relationship between that diversity and neurons' function. Some of that diversity may be incidental, and some of it may be important to its function. Yeah. So when other animals are much more sensitive than, than us in certain domains, is it more receptors, or is there a distinction in uh, Potentially both. I mean, um, for example, uh, the olfactory system of the dog is sort of famously um, sensitive as compared to the human olfactory system, and that's thought to be due in large part to the sheer number of um, olfactory receptor neurons. So, um, you know, olfaction starts where neurons bind, I'm oh, sorry, when odors bind to specific receptor proteins on um, the processes of cells in the nasal mucosa. And if you, sort of the nasal mucosa is the, the nasal epithelium covered by this mucosa layer. If you take the nasal epithelium of a dog 
and sort of unfolded it. It's, it's very folded and invaginated, right? It's, it generally corresponds to roughly the size of the dog's hide. Like it's, it's really <laughs> large, right? And this large surface area means a much better sick of noise ratio um, when it comes to detecting weak odors in the context of a noisy environment, for example. But there is clearly a role for specialized gene expression and specialized molecular machinery um, as well. Uh, so in mechanical sensory systems, some organisms and some cells are conferred with uh, a great sensitivity to um, small displacements because they express uh, proteins that are um, force-gated ion channels, so force-gated sort of electromotive um, objects that have with great sensitivity. Um, okay, so the, the last point I want to make then is just that um, neurons in different sensory brain regions are connected to each other in a hierarchical fashion, such that stimuli are initially encoded in one layer and then they move to a, a subsequent layer and then a layer after that. Of course, there are feedback projections which make things more complicated, but the way we tend to think about this as sensory neuroscientists is that as um, representations move from one layer in the hierarchy to the next, um, uh, the same information is being reformatted such that behaviorally relevant features of the sensory stimulus are being encoded more and more explicitly, such that by the time they reach sensory motor integration centers, the little man in the brain who is looking at all of this and can make rapid and effective decisions. Okay. All right. And another fact, some fun fact of the nervous system that you need to understand for the purpose of this talk is that neurons can be either excitatory or inhibitory. By this I mean that um, excitatory neurons, when they talk to other neurons across synapses, the, the effect of this in, in general is to promote electrical activity in their targets. Inhibitory neurons, when they talk to other neurons across synapses, the effect of this is to suppress or inhibit electrical activity um, in their targets. Okay? Um, all right, so I want to talk to you about what makes neural codes efficient, but before we talk about optimization, we have to have some notion of cost, right? So what are the costs or constraints that impinge on neural codes? Um, so one thing that is important to keep in mind is that um, individual neurons have uh, finite dynamic ranges, right? So we tend to measure the activity of neurons in terms of the rate at which they're firing spikes or action potentials, these are these large, regenerative, um, all or nothing electrical events. And neurons can't have infinitely high spike rates, right? It's just biophysically, um, they're biophysically limited in how fast they can fire. A uh, second kind of constraint is that noise accumulates in neural codes. So, um, so fundamentally, all aspects of biological systems boil down to stochastic processes. And the accumulation of stochasticity leads to um, essentially noise, uh, fluctuations in neural activity that carry no information about the stimulus. And this noise tends to accumulate as signals propagate through hierarchies of neurons within uh, the sensory brain regions. All right? So that's a fundamental limitation that creates ambiguity in what neural activity represents. Um, another kind of constraint to keep in mind is that it would be useful to um, simplify and minimize the wiring in the brain. All right? So neurons talk to other neurons through these long processes that we call axons, and there's some notion among neuroscientists that we want to minimize the amount of wire that's being used in the brain. And just a final constraint. Who's we? <laughs> we? What do we, what do we think? Who wants to minimize? What does that mean, we want to minimize? I mean, <laughs> uh, <laughs> right, so are you saying an evolution and development seek to minimize it? That's, that's, that's a proposal, right? So that the idea is that there's a selective pressure in evolution <clears throat> that um, penalizes a system for having excessive wire. That's the proposal, right? That's what this third bullet that's is right. supposed to convey. So, so it is not the case that yes. you have as much wire as you can possibly fit in? It's actually less than you can possibly be doing. Well, so, so there's some constraint on the sizes of the brains, and there's some constraint on metabolic um, activity, and that's really the fourth. The, you know, these two last two may be related to each other, right? So neural activity is metabolically costly. Um, actually, a large fraction of the energy that you consume as an organism is consumed by your brain, um, and part of what's costly in um, operating brains is that you have to maintain these large gradients of um, ions, right, in order to maintain this electrical activity. And that's sort of related um, some sort of nebulous way to the amount of wire that a brain is consuming. 
right? So I'm not arguing that all these constraints are equally costly, um, but these are constraints that neuroscientists tend to think of as representing some type of constraint on what the brain can and should do. So you say just wiring, you don't care about the number of neurons. So if you have a, one model with less wiring and more neurons, it's better than one with less neurons and more wiring. So neurons are probably also, also costly, again, because they um, just maintaining the ionic gradients across the plasma membrane of a neuron is and require a lot of ATP, a lot of energy, a lot of calories. Um, so there's a constraint on the number of neurons, there's a constraint on the size of the brain, the amount of wire. Um, but but, but like, you list here only the wiring, you don't list the, the nodes of themselves. Uh, I think just because in a few slides I'm going to make an argument about distance, and okay. that bears on wiring. I'm not going to make an argument about neural number, although I'm actually very interested in that, because the brains that my lab studies are brains that contain about 100,000 neurons, which are orders and orders of magnitude fewer than what your brain contains. But what does the word codes mean? What's neural codes? Right. So sensory neuroscientists talk about neural coding in the sense that we talk about the role, you know, whenever you have an uh, event in the world outside the brain um, that is systematically related to a change in the pattern of electrical activity in some neurons in the brain, um, we talk about that relationship as if the neurons were encoding that information. Um, some people don't like to use those terms, but that's what neuroscientists mean when they say that. <laughs> and what, one more question, what's the dynamic range of the neurons? It depends on the neuron. Some neurons have peak firing rates on the order of 100 spikes a second. Other neurons have peak firing rates on the order of say, 300 spikes a second. But a lot less than 10 to 7. Much less, yes. <laughs> well, and, um, you know, the absolute <coughs> number doesn't matter so much as how many um, discriminable levels you have. And that's limited by noise. Um, so there's sufficiently large amounts of noise are added to neural signals as they progress through these hierarchies that the number of discriminable um, levels of firing rate under and available to it is pretty constrained. Okay. So given <laughs> all these um, constraints, uh, what does this tell us about what, uh, you know, how the brain might organize um, the format of its sensory codes, if we want to use that word? Um, and so an idea that has a lot of um, credence in the world of sensory neuroscience is what's called the efficient coding hypothesis. And this is an idea that's um, been uh, discussed and investigated by many uh, scientists and laboratories over the years and is historically probably most associated with a man named Horace Barlow who developed this idea in the late 50s and early 60s. Um, so the efficient coding hypothesis has two parts. Um, the first part is that you know, all things being equal, each neuron should use all parts of its dynamic range with um, roughly equal frequency. And it's important to realize that this is a consequence of the fact that neurons have a finite, um, limited dynamic range and neural codes are noisy. This means that only a finite number of response levels can be discriminated unambiguously. And thus, each neuron has only a limited um, number of like symbols at its disposal. And information theory teaches us that maximizing the rate of information transfer um, involves maximizing entropy among signals, right? Um, so we're going to use all signals at roughly equal frequency. But stimuli in the world don't occur um, with equal frequency, and so it's important for a neuron to match its input-output function to the statistical distribution of stimuli in the world. Yeah? So when you talk about wiring, suppose I look at olfactory wiring plus visual wiring plus cognitive wiring. There's a trade-off between all three. Right. What am I minimizing? Uh, well, so I mean, there are different brain regions, so there's no trade-off. But, but as an organism, I could invest in one, not the other one. Uh, right, so it depends on your ecology. Right. Um, and I think so that's, so yeah. Somehow you want to tie to the information and what information I want to use. Exactly. So I think that's, a, that's actually a very perceptive point, which is that the goal of a biological organism is not to maximize efficiency in some sort of global sense, much less some kind of aesthetic sense, um, but to get um, news you can use, right? Like information that's useful for behavioral tasks given the ecological niche that that organism occupies. Well, how, how do you know that? You only have knowledge on the output. You don't know how it happens inside. This is the assumption, but, you know, but not, not justified. Well, I think there's, there's substantial evidence that the nervous systems of different organisms differ in a way that's systematically related to their ecology. So my lab studies... Well, it is related, but it's, it's a factor, but maybe a minor factor, right? Uh, Sure. I mean, 
it's because obvious thing to believe so, but it's the only reason because it's obvious. Right, I mean, there are other variations, there are other features of nervous systems that probably are unrelated to the yeah. peculiar ecology of an animal. Like, you know, it's just very difficult to build certain kinds of body plans or certain kinds of brain plans. Right? Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, and of course, we all have an evolutionary trajectory, and where we are as a species is limited by our evolutionary trajectory and also by um, kind of the mechanisms of development, right? We can only develop along certain pathways, not along other pathways. Yeah. Now, so those are important points. So then this hypothesis depend on the end degree? We don't all talk half the time during the size. No. Right. Uh, there, there's like a bunch of interesting problems with this hypothesis. <coughs> uh, let me go through the ideas and we can then talk about maybe the, the, the limitations of this idea. Um, right. So, so kind of the two parts of this hypothesis, the first part is that each neuron should use each part of its dynamic range with equal frequency. Um, and that means that a neuron's input-output function should be adapted to this statistical distribution of stimuli in the world. So the basic idea is this. Imagine um, an aspect of the stimulus that's um, represented by a single uh, continuous variable here on the x-axis. Um, and then there's some probability of finding stimuli with each of these values um, here on the y-axis. So we have a histogram of the stimulus distribution. Let's imagine it's light intensity, okay? Right, so the most common intensity of light is this, and these intensities are less likely. Um, if you're encoding this information in a system that consists of one neuron, what do you want the input-output function of this neuron to look like? You want it to look like the cumulative histogram of the um, stimulus probability distribution, right? Such that the, the steepest part of this distribution is positioned such that it corresponds to the value of the stimulus parameter, which is most likely, okay? And this is important because um, you want the neuron to be maximally sensitive to stimuli that are most common um, because the neural codes tend to be then contaminated by noise at later processing stages. Mm -hmm. And the larger the differential between the final rate evoked by two stimuli, the more immunized that discri discrimination is from contamination by noise later on, okay? What, what's the x-axis? What does it mean, stimulus? Um, it, think of it as uh, the value of the stimulus. So uh, if, if it's a visual stimulus, it might be, say, the uh, degree of luminance of this pixel, right? Or if it's an odor, it would be the concentration of the odor. Or oh, so it's the strength of the odor. Uh, yeah. Not just the strength. Any, any um, one-dimensional uh, continuous, um, or not even discontinuous aspect of the stimulus. Say, say you're looking at um, the visual stimulus. Orientation matters, right? So it could be the orientation of this bar. Right, we're going to plot um, the probability versus orientation. Right, so a lot of orientations occur with roughly frequency. People have argued that horizontal orientations are more common because of the horizon line. It's an mm -hmm. interesting idea, right? So this could be any, any well, one so dimensional. Somehow it's, a one, it's a one parameter family of inputs. With the, is that right? And, and there's a probability of the So in reality, stimuli are many dimensional, but I'm just talking about the one dimensional case for simplicity. Um, I understand. Yeah. I mean, right. So. so did I say it right? Is it a one parameter family of, of potential inputs and this is the probability distribution of it? Exactly. Where you would see it on this family. Exactly. Is that right? Could you explain uh, why the second graph looks the way it does? So the idea is then that um, uh, if we, let's imagine cutting out um, different sort of wedges of um, uh, you know, this distribution of stimuli. Um, yeah, sort of I, mean, I think I understand what it is. But, yeah. But you said something else about its significance. So why would that be useful, for example? <laughs> Maybe I just missed what you, what you said. <coughs> so the second one represents the area underneath. Uh, right, yeah, so the, the first the one up to a given point. Yeah, so I mean, that's how you, you, you get this by just taking the cumulative distribution of this, but what the yeah, bottom graph represents it's is it's the input-output function for a neuron, right? It's so the most efficient way of sensing that signal, mm -hmm. given the proper history. So that's what you want to do. Right, uh, according to this idea, right, which is, which has problems, it's not 100% accepted, but it's a useful way of thinking about things for neuroscientists, right? So if you're a neuron, you're going to encode this value of the stimulus, be it luminate, luminance, orientation, odor concentration, whatever, um, according to this input-output function, right? And the argument then is that, um, uh, you know, by placing the maximal region of sensitivity of the neuron 
nearest the, the part of the stimulus distribution with the highest occupancy, you get the maximum sensitivity um, overall and thus better uh, contamination from noise at later processing stages. Yeah? So is, how should one think about the role of the noise that you keep mentioning? So for example, if you made, if, could you imagine making a theoretical model that didn't have any noise in it, and then would it be very different, or what, what, would that, what would it be? Is the noise, you know, how essential is it? Yeah. Or is it? So, so there are whole families of models in theoretical neuroscience that are deterministic, that have no noise term, and there are other families of models that have a noise term, right? Um, and whether or not you include a noise term depends on what kind of question you want to ask. So if you want to ask the question of, for example, how does noise propagate through a network with a certain topology, then obviously you need a noise term. Um, if you uh, want to ask questions about, say, the dynamics of a circuit, given certain topology, then you don't need a noise term. So, so I mean, certain questions in neuroscience require things about noise and other questions don't. Um, okay, so, so that's kind of just the first part of the efficient coding hypothesis. The, the second part is that um, uh, all things being equal, um, evolution is under selective pressure to uh, minimize redundancy between neurons. And this is just a way of saying that if we consider different neurons as different sets of symbols, then maximizing the entropy of symbol use um, requires us to minimize these correlations between neurons. Um, and again, th this efficient coding hypothesis is not without its critics. I mean, people have pointed out there's actually a lot of redundancy between neural signals in the brain. Um, so what, you know, what's that for? What's going on there? Uh, so in any event, what I want to do today is to think about um, the question, if we take this hypothesis uh, at face value just for the purposes of argument, um, what does it imply about what the uh, structure of wiring between brain, uh, you know, neurons within a brain region should look like? Um, an important idea is that the brain can keep neurons within a narrow operating range and minimize redundancy between neurons um, by uh, what one might term uh, as generating a prediction, that a generating a prediction of what the stimulus might be, um, and then encoding only deviations from that prediction. Right, and so, you know, let me walk you through how this might work. Imagine for concreteness an ensemble of neurons that's encoding some stimulus. Let's imagine these are neurons in the visual system, right? So each of them has um, corresponds to some preferred location of uh, the visual stimulus in space, right? And visual neurons can conveniently, that are selective for nearby points in space, tend to be near each other, all right, in the retina, for example. Okay, so these neurons, um, respond to light in such a way that they um, receive feed-forward excitation from photoreceptors, but they also um, have mutually antagonistic interactions with each other, right? And that these interactions fall off of distance. Um, and that means that, um, in a sense, the uh, response of a neuron is determined by, uh, again, feed-forward excitation from photoreceptors, so that corresponds to a large weighting of stimuli near the center of its receptive field, but then inhibition from nearby neurons within this brain region, or this region of the retina, such that um, light that falls on uh, regions that are near the center but not at the center actually results in um, relative inhibition of this, this neuron. Okay? So you can imagine then different points in space being weighted by this weighting function or you know, linear filter, and then summed together, and then that weighted sum um, becomes the input to the neuron's input-output function. Um, and uh, then, you know, if we think about this in concrete terms from this example in the visual world, um, if that happened, uh, only neurons um, that were encoding this edge would be strongly active. Neurons that were not near the edge would be much uh, more weakly active. And the upshot of this is that once you um, encode only deviations from prediction rather than um, the absolute value of the stimulus, if the neuron's input-output function is situated such that the steepest part of that function is near zero, then you're going to have um, a neuron that's highly responsive to small changes in the stimulus, and that representation will be better contaminated um, from noise. So let's turn to the question of how might the brain display <coughs> what we might call evolutionary knowledge, or equivalently developmental knowledge, of natural statistics in the world. 
So, so natural statistics is always just a unimodal? The probability distribution is only one mode? It doesn't have to be unimodal. So if it's multimodal, does it break them in as a mixture and tries to match for each mode or tries to come up with output? Uh, that's that's an interesting mode? question. Um, you know, I haven't thought enough about that idea to give you any useful response, but there's no reason why these distributions have unimodal, have to be unimodal at all. Yeah. yeah. It seems like uh, naturally to break, break it up as mixtures right. and optimize each one. So. Well, so this slide may speak to a complication that may be related to the complication you're talking about. So um, I'm going to argue to you that knowledge of evolution, you know, knowledge of statistics as embodied in evolution, um, is manifest in part by looking at where neurons are in the brain. So if you look within a certain brain region um, uh, that's encoding sensory information you'll often see what neuroscientists call a sensory map. And what that means is that neurons that um, are co-activated tend to be near each other. So the most famous example of this probably um, is in the somatosensory system. So it turns out that neurons in your cortex, right, so like relatively high level representation of your body surface that encode nearby locations in your skin tend to be near each other. And this was mapped out in the human brain really spectacularly um, in the 50s by a neurologist named Wilder Penfield. And he found through a series of experiments with um, uh, awake human patients who were undergoing uh, surgery to treat um, intractable epilepsy that um, you know, the different parts of the body were represented in this continuous fashion on the surface of the cortical region of the brain like this. Um, again, so neurons that are co-activated because they um, represent nearby locations in the skin, turn out to be near each other. Now, there's kind of interesting discontinuities in this map. You'll notice that the, there's a discontinuity between the face map here and the, um, the map of the fingers. There's also kind of an interesting discontinuity here between the toes and the genitals, which I don't remember really understood. It might have something to do with foot fetishes. Um, <laughs> actually, interesting, the guy I used to sit next to when I took neuroanatomy was a triple uh, amputee. And he told me that um, when he was having his genitals fondled, it made him feel like his phantom toes were being touched. And I thought that was the most disturbing idea. <laughs> uh, anyway, why does it matter that neurons that are um, representing co-activated stimuli are near each other? Well, it matters because there's the idea that there's this wiring in the brain. So if you're going to set up mutually antagonistic interactions between um, neurons, you want them to be nearby and that mutual antagonism between co-activated neurons is the way that you get efficient codes in the sense of efficiency that we've been talking about. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to the question, um, do any of the ideas that I've been talking to about extend to the sense of smell, right? So it's kind of notable that I've been using examples mainly drawn from vision and somatic sensation because these are two sensory modalities where it's kind of easy to think about um, natural statistics, right? It's kind of natural that if an object touches um, this part of my arm is going to touch a nearby part of my arm, right? Um, it's harder to think about the questions of natural statistics when we think about chemical stimuli. So what does this mean? Well, so we don't know the distribution of chemical compounds in the world. Um, and this is in part because it's just quite difficult to do analytical chemistry in, in a way that's as rapid and facile and detailed as the way that we have technology to analyze the visual world or the auditory world, okay? Um, it's just, just quite hard, hard to walk around the streets of New York and figure out the distribution of chemical compounds in a given city block, right? Um, so what, what I'm going to argue to you is that we can infer whether there are statistical regularities in the olfactory world by investigating the brain's olfactory processing center. At least we can figure out whether there are statistical regularities that um, the organism where studies cares about. Okay, so I have to tell you a little bit about the um, neuroanatomy of the olfactory system. Right, so olfaction begins when odor molecules bind to receptor proteins on the processes of olfactory receptor neurons. These processes are present, as I said, in your olfactory mucosa. Um, and importantly, each of these receptor neurons, I'm going to call them ORNs, expresses just a single receptor. Okay? And there are multiple um, uh, receptors, um, many, many neurons, uh, and importantly, um, Olfactory receptor neurons that express a given receptor are present, um, distributed quasi-randomly throughout the olfactory epithelium. Okay, so there's not sort of like a strong spatial correlation here. But, but they don't, not of all animals, like for worms, for example, so, so. 
Pardon? Uh, for animals that have very few, very few olfactory uh, neurons in the brain is possible for that, like for worms, yeah? It's not so, it cannot be. Oh, uh, you mean, are they not? Right. right. Um, there are 50 neurons, yeah, and, and they just look well. Right, so the, in the organism that my laboratory studies, yeah. the fruit fly, yeah, the course. distribution of olfactory receptor neurons on the antenna um, doesn't look, it's actually not random at all. You can often find like an individual identifiable neuron in the exact same place, like in every single antenna. Mm -hmm. But the distribution is broad. Okay, so uh, neurons that express different receptors are interleaved, salt and pepper fashion on the antenna um, or in the olfactory mucosa. So it doesn't have to be strictly random. All this means is that information about the spatial location of an odorant on the surface of the olfactory organ is essentially thrown away. Okay, so we're throwing away space for this discussion. That's what I want you to know. Just uh, so we, we are uh, the process of uh, generating uh, the uh, the smell is, is is clear. So we know exactly what what chemicals are determining, and you know it's like we have three colors and every you know RGB and we have the, the percentages, and this is this color, this is this color. We can do the same thing with smell. That's knowable. Um, knowable, but no, okay. but not entirely known. Okay. There's no reason we can't know it. It's just that you know, the only problem is that you know um, uh, smells are um, this is such a high dimensional stimulant space. You have to ask yourself, how do I explore this comprehensively? Do I just take the sigma Aldrich catalog and order every you know compound out of the catalog? Like how do I do this systematically? It's, it's quite hard to think about. Um, but you can get a good sense of the molecular tuning of a neuron by just throwing a lot of chemicals at it, and you can write down what its firing rate is in response to those chemicals. Um, right. Um, so, so now, how is the smell represented in this? Okay, so at this layer, how is the input represented? Yes, so at this you layer, have then put it's different colors. Different it's a colors here are colors different receptors. Spot. Yeah, different receptors, right? And so it's important to know that a given mono, you have monomolecular odorant, um, typically binds to multiple receptor protein types, and a given receptor protein is bound by multiple kinds of monomolecular odorant. So it's always a combinatorial or population code. So okay. how many receptors are there in the, uh, right. in, so the, in, in the fly? In, in the fly, different type of receptors. 50. 50 different kinds yeah. of receptors. Yeah. Which to my mind is a nice number, like small enough to be tractable. But it gives you a lot of combinatorial coding. But each smell is represented by a various combination of these. Precisely. What yeah. was the number? 50. 50. Okay. Five zero. Yep. Okay, so then another. Okay, what does it mean? The different type. Can you repeat what it means? Different type. All right. So here, the pink receptor expressing neurons would be a type. The blue receptor expressing neurons would but be a type. But they're different. They're new receptors and neurons. So receptors on the neuron. Oh, 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 oh. A, re a receptor, in my terminology, is a protein. It's a protein on, on the neuron. Okay. On the surface of a neuron okay. that confers a certain chemical selectivity okay. on that neuron. But the single neuron here, or what? Right, right, those gray balls are single neurons. It's a single neuron, and what's hitting there? Okay. Right. But in the fly, there are um, uh, order a couple thousand um, neurons. Uh, neurons yeah. Okay, so now, uh, importantly, um, all the receptor neurons that express the same receptor, so all the receptor neurons of a certain type, project processes, these long processes called axons, um, to the same region in the olfactory propagand center. And these regions are called glomeruli for the Latin word glomus or ball. And that's just because they're sort of balls of neuropil. They're balls um, that are kind of anatomically delimit delimited um, where axons um, come in and contact the processes of neurons in the brain. Okay? And so there's then a one-to-one -one relationship between um, these receptor proteins um, and glomeruli. So just as there are 50 receptors in the fly, there are 50 glomeruli, 50 coding channels as it were. And there, um, these receptor neurons make uh, synapses with second order neurons, and each second order neuron innervates just a single glomerulus. So that means there are 50 types of second order neurons. Okay? So these are excitatory but connections. Single, no, there are many neurons for each type, yeah? Yeah, there are actually it's many it's second order neurons and many yeah. first order neurons corresponding to each glomerulus. Um, and then these glomeruli are interconnected by a network of local neurons, and these are inhibitory neurons, and that's important for you to know. Okay? And um, many of these inhibitory neurons visit all glomeruli, and, but others of them have more restricted innervation patterns. All right. All right. Uh, so all the facts that I've told you um, are essentially true of both mammals and flies. 
Well, in mammals, the local neurons don't visit all glomerular lines, but many of them are quite broadly innervating, right? So the basic architecture here is strikingly similar in animals that are evolutionarily very distant. Um, How many types of receptors do we have, for example? That's a good question. So the, the rodents have about 1,000. In humans, the majority, although certainly not all, other receptors have become pseudogenes, meaning that they've acquired mutations in human evolution which make them non-functional. Um, and interestingly, the acquisition of these um, uh, uh, sort of pseudogene mutations in the human olfactory cohort more or less coincided in primate evolution with the acquisition of trichromatic color vision um, in old world monkeys. So, you know, it's tempting to speculate that, you know, if you have really good color vision, you don't need to rely on your sense of smell so much. I, I don't know if that's true. How many does a dog have? Uh, I think dogs are, I don't know for sure, I would imagine that they're similar to other mammals that rely on uh, the sense of smell, so like rodents, about a thousand. So in humans, it's about 350 are functional. But the identity of which genes are pseudogenes um, shows a lot, of a lot of allelic variation in the population. So, um, and the precise structure of the receptor shows a lot of allelic variation in the population. So each of us um, in this room has a different cohort of odin receptors. And in fact, every human who's ever lived probably has a different cohort. Can you tell the gene sequence in us? Sure, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there are interesting studies, you know, basically identifying the genetic locus that causes some people to be able to smell the smell of asparagus in urine and other people not to be able to. Um, there are also different variations in sensitivity to um, uh, steroid hormones and things like that. Are the, the different types of ORNs um, not even equinumerous, I presume? Um, they're not. Um, and what's the sort of range between the... Uh, in the fly, I think they differ order fourfold in numerosity, with the most numerous types corresponding to receptors for pheromones. Um, in general, you know, the sensitivity should go like root N, um, so more numerous suggests, you know, like a high, uh, high uh, selective pressure for sensitivity for the links. Um, all right, so um, in the fly, uh, the arrangement of glomeruli looks kind of like a, um, a bunch of grapes. So in this image, um, the different um, compartments represent different glomeruli, and as we go from left to right, we're just peeling off dorsal glomeruli to look at more ventral glomeruli. Okay, so let's get back to this issue of natural statistics and um, efficient coding. I made the claim to you that if there are um, sort of uh, there's, if the olfactory brain is practicing efficient coding in the way that I have described it to you in the context of vision, for example, then um, olfactory glomeruli that are co-activated by odors should be um, located near each other. Um, and so, insofar as people have looked at this in the fly brain, um, it looks like the answer is no. And so here you see a representation of a substantial subset of the glomeruli in the fly brain they're color-coded um, according to the chemical category of the compounds that represent the highest affinity ligands for these glomeruli. And you can see that there's not a particularly strong um, pattern of chemotopy here, right? Um, and so this is a kind of anecdotal way of looking at this data. Um, there actually are more systematic analyses that have been done in the mammalian olfactory bulb, um, where uh, investigators have um, uh, sort of exposed the mammalian olfactory bulb to a very large set of compounds. You can write down the chemical selectivity of each glomerulus as a 100-dimensional vector if you've thrown 100 um, compounds at it. And then you can ask, is there a relationship between the distance between two glomeruli and the correlation coefficient of their odor selectivity vectors? And the answer is essentially no. Um, can, can you explain what these two graphs are? I so these are, these are not really graphs. The, these I mean the two pictures? These two, two pictures. Um, so this is the front <coughs> and back of um, the olfactory processing region of the fly brain. Each um, ball represents a glomerulus, and the glomeruli are color-coded according to the chemical group, um, uh, which represents the best set of ligands for these glomeruli. So I'm supposed to notice that the same colors are near each other? Not particularly. That's what I'm supposed exactly. to notice Exactly. There you got it. Yes, it's not that complicated. Um, I should point out that so far I've not shown you any data from my lab, and this is actually data from um, a laboratory at Yale, uh, directed by uh, John Carlson, who is Marion Carlson's brother. It's entirely uh, coincidental. 
<laughs> but wait, but I understood that each of these things would affect a set of glomeruli, not not one. That's right. Um, so you so, see but that um, only one is colored. So uh, no. So ketones here are uh, you know these two glomeruli are um, have ketones as their best ligands. I see. Okay. So you should look at the distance between those two. Yeah, you should say. Red ones, yeah, you example. should say basically. Not individual like, distance. Yeah. Do, do, do the green glomeruli tend to be clustered together or not? Um, they're not. They're not really more clustered than chance. I mean, you can kind of see, you know, whales in the clouds, but <laughs> you know, they're, they're they're not particularly orderly. Um, so what this argues is we don't see kind of an, an odor map in the fly brain um, or in the mammalian brain, at least not an odor map that says systematic is what we see in the visual brain or the somatosensory brain. Although there are people in the field who would disagree with me in that kind of interesting argument. Um, so what role might we see for efficient coding or natural statistics in the way that odors are encoded? Um, so let's think about this more broadly. So to answer this question, we want to actually uh, monitor, monitor, monitor activity in the brain. The maps I just showed you um, reflected uh, recordings that were done in the periphery, what's going on in the brain, where you have these mutually antagonistic relationships between neurons, right? So to monitor things like this, um, we place uh, flies under upright compound microscopes like this. We do a little dissection of the fly brain in the way that um, Dr. Fishbach described to you. Uh, the ventral part of the fly remains dry, and the dorsal part of the fly is bathed in oxygenated saline, and we can just insert electrodes here. And what we're doing then is making recordings from individual neurons in the fly brain in vivo. And many of these neurons are, um, have, like, are, are identifiable to us. So we can go back and report from the exact same neuron in the collection of 100,000 neurons in the fly brain in one fly after another after another. So we can build a cumulative knowledge of how these neurons encode stimuli and how they connect. Oh, the same them. animal with different animals. Different animals. Yeah. Yeah. Lactation, it can so much identify. Location, we need to relate location function or neuron. That's right. So we, we identify them as the same neuron based on a combination of location and um, genetic markers. Right? So this is a genetic model organism, meaning we have a lot of genetic tools that allow us to label specific neurons with fluorescent proteins. Hmm. So this color coding that we saw on the previous slide, this would be for, for, for many mean. flies. Exactly. Yeah. Every single fly looks essentially like that. Right. How you can make markers on a, on, on a leaf fly? Pardon? On, you know, how, how can you use markers on, on a leaf fly? How can you? Oh, I see. So they're genetically encoded, right? So clever people have found ah, ways really, to insert yeah, uh, okay, okay. Yeah, from jellyfish and okay, fruit okay, flies. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's all you need to know, yeah. right? Okay. <laughs> also, I should say, this is not to scale, so uh, it really looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so these are really small flies. Okay. Um, <laughs> So we can uh, do things like um, use genetically encoded uh, sensors of calcium, which is a proxy for neural activity, to monitor broad spatial patterns of activity, and then we can use electrodes to look at activity in single neurons at high temporal resolution. Okay? So what happens when we image the brain? Well, we can, for mm -hmm. example, look at activity in olfactory receptor neurons. So here, a genetically encoded calcium indicator, again, just an indicator of neural activity, is present selectively in the receptor neurons. We puff on different odors. Um, and what we see is different spots of activity, elicited by odor one, two, three, four, right? And these two different rows just represent different um, vertical planes through the brain, all right? So again, this, this collection of glomeruli is like a ball of brains. So it's three-dimensional, all right? So here we've chosen odors that um, we've chosen them kind of carefully so that they activate these little foci of activity corresponding more or less to single glomeruli. So the question I want to ask then um, is given that neurons, given that glomeruli um, are not spatially organized according to their chemical preference as far as we can tell, um, what are the rules that govern the recruitment of mutually antagonistic interactions between neurons, right? So given these odor stimuli that activate the foci of receptor neuron input, what patterns of activity do you see in these inhibitory local neurons? So now we're going to express um, this indicator in the local neurons, and we're going to look at the spatial pattern of neural activity in these local neurons. And again, what we're looking at here are um, sort of s horizontal slices through um, this olfactory brain region. So different spots or foci correspond to glomeruli. Um, so what we see in response to these odors is a very broad pattern of activity. It's not homogeneous, 
but the inhomogeneities um, are pretty much the same for uh, all the different odor stimuli that we're looking at. It just looks as if, as we change the odor stimulus, we take this spatial pattern and we scale it up or down. We make it more or less intense, corresponding to more or less neural activity. Um, and so I, I've claimed to you that this spatial pattern is essentially the same for all odors. We can look at this a little bit more rigorously by doing principal components analysis on these different images. So insofar as they're all um, just scaled versions of each other, then all the variance between them should be um, encapsulated by a single principal and component um, with a different intensity in each image. Indeed, if we do um, principal components analysis on these images, the first PC looks like this, so it looks a lot like um, all of these images, and that accounts for a large fraction of the variance in these images, and it turns out it accounts for essentially all the explainable variance, so all the variance that's not due to um, stochasticity or, or experimental error. So what this means is that the pattern of activity um, in uh, uh, this network of mutually antagonistic interactions is um, essentially global, so it goes everywhere, it visits all glomeruli, and it's odor invariant. All right. You said mutually antagonistic, but before you said inhibitory. So I'm you know, using those terms, I'm using antagonistic and inhibitory essentially interchangeably. Right. So I'm, meaning them, I'm using them both to mean um, that neural activity is suppressed as a consequence. Yeah. Okay, so what exactly is odor invariant? The idea of the spatial pattern. So these different odors here correspond to the uh, four different odors that we're using here. So each, each of these four odors activates essentially a single glomerulus. One, two, three, four, and these two um, yeah. slices. And these four stimuli that produce this very focal, spatially organized pattern of afferent activity to the network um, turn out to produce this uh, very diffuse global pattern of activity in the inhibitory interneurons. This is one glomerulus? So all, uh, all the glomeruli, well, um, a large fraction of the glomeruli are oh, in this image. This is just one vertical plane. If we went down another the vertical plane, we'd catch more glomeruli. So these are covered by local neurons. So here we have, we're looking at activity in local mm -hmm. neurons, right? And so, so this is not global neurons. Pardon? This is not activity in the global neurons, but this is controlled by the local neurons. It's in the glomeruli because right. the local it's neurons innervate right. the glomeruli. Right. That's right. But it's um, essentially the pattern of activity that's moving between channels and that's inhibitory in response to the odors that we're using. All right. So what this means is that focal <laughs> activity of one glomerulus produces inhibition throughout the network. And that the pattern, spatial pattern of inhibition is essentially odor invariant. All that is varying is its intensity. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, the signal you pick up is mainly from the cell body, right? For the calcium imaging? In this case, no. So in this case, what we're picking up is signal from the neurites. And okay. these local interneurons in the circuit um, don't have axons. So uh, neurotransmitter release is from <laughs> um, the dendrites. So they're forming dendrodendritic okay. synapses with yeah. um, principal neurons. Because I was curious, you said before they, the individual interneurons um, contact multiple yes. glomeruli, lines. So I was wondering where the cell body is located. But right. So the cell body is seeing. The yeah, it's out here. Okay. It's kind of irrelevant. Cool. <laughs> so, how does this antagonistic activity work with masking? Uh, it's a very interesting idea. So um, the slide I'm about to get to, I think, speaks to the issue of how I'm kind of to think about how you might think about masking. Okay, so what could be the function of a network of interactions between neurons uh, that's mutually inhibitory, that's global, that's relatively non-specific? Um, uh, how does this affect uh, anything? How can it be useful? Well, let's think about how inhibition affects the input-output function of um, a glomerulus. So we can map this input-output function using what I'm going to call a private odor. So here. You know, we're choosing an odor that interacts with only one of the odor receptors in the schematic, the green receptor, all right? And we're monitoring activity in the ORNs that express the green receptor, that's what the top red arrow represents, and also we're monitoring activity in the second order neurons that are postsynaptic, in other words, directly downstream from um, the receptor neurons that express the green receptor. And so by looking at the, the patterns of activity, you know, the level of activity in the first order neurons and the second order neurons in this processing channel, we can deduce the input output function of the processing channel. The input is receptor neurons, the output is the second order neurons. So very directly then we're, we're looking at what this glomerulus computes. So we do this by varying odor concentration. Each point represents a different concentration of this private odor. 
And what we can see is that the input output function is very steep and saturating. All right. So you can pick a smell so that it affects just a single I mean, right. particular receptor? That's right. That's right. Wow. It's, it's quite hard to do. We work very hard. <laughs> we found it. So each receptor corresponds to a particular smell. No, most no. most smells activate many receptors. Right. That's but, why but we had to work. But it is also the case that you can correlate one can each receptor with a specific smell. Um, it is it is possible to mm -hmm. find smells that activate. It's possible to find odor stimuli that activate single receptors. Yeah, and that's what we've done here. Yeah. For which one? Of um, just one one for which we could do this. Right? <laughs> Okay, so what's interesting here then is what happens when um, we drive activity in the network. So to drive activity in the network, we're going to add a second odor. I'm going to call it a public odor that binds to multiple receptor species. In this case, the blue and the orange receptors. This drives um, more activity in the network, drives more activity in local interneurons, more uh, interaction between glomeruli. But importantly, this odor doesn't bind to the green receptors. Right, so now we're going to blend this public odor in with the private odor at increasing concentrations of the public odor. What we see is as we increase the concentration of the public odor, we shift um, the shape of this input-output function such that the amount of receptor neuron input that's needed to drive um, the second third neuron to half of its maximum firing rate is increased. The, the se essentially, the second third neuron is behaving as if the concentration of its private ligand is lower than it really was. Right. So this is kind of interesting, sort of like a competitive antagonist. Um, so, what does this mean for the way neurons are encoded by uh, odors are encoded by populations of neurons? Well, um, let's uh, think about this first of all in terms of the populations of the first order neurons. Then we'll go on to thinking about the populations of the second order neurons. So, this is data again collected by John Carlson's lab at Yale, um, representing the responses of a large population of receptor neurons to a very large set of odor stimuli. So, there's something like 25 or 30 receptor neuron types here, and like over 100 odor stimuli. The color represents firing rate, so the intensity of neural activity. And this data is organized such that receptor neuron types or glomeruli are um, rows, and odor stimuli are columns. Okay, and we've um, sort of organized this data such that um, the odors that drive the most activity are on the left, and the um, receptors that uh, are most responsive are on the bottom. Okay? And what I want you to notice is that there's a um, pretty strong degree of correlation between coding channels. So there's a lot of resemblance between rows. In other words, different receptors have rather similar toning to each other compared to what you would expect from random chance. That could occur in part because receptors arrive in evolution through gene duplication. Um, but there are also less, less interesting reasons for that as well. Okay, so now let's just imagine what this looks like at the level of the second order neurons. It's very tedious to collect all this data, so we just did a simulation. But the simulation has no free parameters, so you should respect it. Right? And what we did then is we just took the input-output function that we measured here, and we took each of the points in um, this matrix, and we just transformed it through this measured input-output function. And this input-output function turns out to be essentially the same for most glomerular lines, so this is kosher. And what we obtain is um, this population code. So this is what we think um, uh, representations would look like at the level of second order neurons if there weren't inhibitory interactions between the Mary line. So as you might imagine, because the input output function is saturating, you see a lot of saturation in these signals, right, at the, at the bottom left-hand corner of these um, matrices. Um, so now let's... Um, in our simulation, turn on inhibitory interactions between channels. And again, there are no free parameters in this simulation. All we're doing is we're implementing the levels of inhibition between glomeruli that we've measured and we know exist, and we're pretending that all these interactions are uniform. So all interactions have the same strength between glomeruli, which we think is not true precisely, but is probably a good first approximation. So is, is it correct to say that that one uses only the top curve. That's right, that's right. It's only and the top now curve. you're including the lower curve. That's right. And we know which in lower a curve. In, in, in a way which is measured, which is it's determined all measured. empirically. There are no free parameters, and right? So you're not fitting. That's right. And we know which of the lower curves to draw from because um, we determined that uh, the magnitude of this suppression 
goes more or less linearly with the total amount of activity in the receptor population. Okay, mm -hmm. so for each odor stimulus, each column, we add up the amount of activity in the receptor population, we use that to choose which curve we're drawing from, and then we just get this, right? And this, we think, is a reasonable approximation of what population could look like at the level of second order neurons. And I want you to notice two things. Number one, there's much less saturation here, um, so neurons are more sensitive to differences between stimuli. And second of all, um, different neurons, that is, different rows, different glomeruli, are decorrelated, right? So there's less redundancy in this representation as compared to the top two um, representations. So in that sense, it's a more efficient code. So why does this work? You know, what you're seeing is dumb connections give you a smart transformation. The connections are dumb in the sense that they're kind of all to all, they're more or less global. But you get a smart transformation, you get a more efficient code, I'm going to argue, because the correlations are really strong and dumb to begin with. In other words, because receptor neurons are so similar to each other to begin with, all to all mutual antagonism gives you a, quite a big gain, right? Um, so, the, again, this may be a feature of the fact that receptors arose in evolution through gene duplication. It may be a feature of the fact that some odors are just more volatile than others, or some odors just interact better with, you know, the hydrophobic pockets that are the binding pockets of these receptors. But because receptor activity is relatively strongly correlated to begin with, um, these winner-take-all competitions that are all to all um, give you a substantial amount of decorrelation. Um, so I could just wrap up here. I could speak briefly about correlations in the time domain. Um, uh, are we up for five more minutes? Five more minutes? Yeah. And then we can continue. Okay. Sounds good. I'm just trying to find the private order. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure the private order is part of this set, actually. I should also say that um, Virtually no odor is private thru, um, throughout uh, its concentration range, right? So from the lowest concentration of both any activity up to saturated vapor, you pretty much always recruit some glomerulus. So we had to work within narrow ranges to keep odors private. Yeah. So, so t just to understand how you did simulation, so you use these private odors to, to find the connection and to find this uh, the function? We use function? the private odors to define the function, to measure the function. And then, and then we assume the function is the same for all glomeruli, which is close to true. And then based on that single saturating function, we go from the top matrix to the second matrix. And then we build in... Um, How do you build the inhibition? We build an inhibition by... We measure this family of curves, right, um, that differ depending on the concentration of the public odor. And what we see is that the amount by which these curves shifts, in other words, um, these are hyperbolic ratio functions, and the value of the semi-saturation constant is more or less a linear function of the number of spikes in the receptor neuron layer. Mm -hmm. So for each of the odors in this top matrix, we add up all the spikes in the receptor neuron layer for that column. That allows us to figure out which curve in the family of curves we're dealing with, and then we, then we just look up the yeah, level yeah, of activity. Like that. That's right, in the second order neuron. So it's a pretty constrained simulation. I think it's pretty close to what's going on. We cross-checked it. All right, so I'll do this quick. I also just want to put out, so now we're kind of a downer. I've told you that they're not, <laughs> they're it's like just dumb connectivity in this brain region. Or it's kind of a downer. I just want to end with an upper. All right, what about the time domain? That's an area where there are strong um, correlations, and I think there's in something interesting going on here. When you think about the physics of air, the physics of air are true, you know, is the same around the globe. That imposes certain statistical regularities in the time domain because it, it controls how odors um, spread in air and thus how they fluctuate in time from the point of view of a sensor that's moving through a plume or a sensor that's staying still when a plume is moving across it. Right? So you can measure these fluctuations in time with, say, a rapid photoionization detector. If you put it um, in the context of just sort of a natural turbulent plume, these are measurements that we've done, um, you get these sort of um, intermittent odor hits, and what you can see is that the time scale and statistics of these hits in, uh, depends on the, um, the wind conditions. It's, it dates it's your molecules in a given point of space, yeah, with the vertical line. That's right. It's the voltage off the photoionization detector, which corresponds to the concentration of the odor. Yeah. So what you see is you see um, these kind of relatively prolonged odor hits separated by long pockets of clean air at low wind speeds, 
much more rapid fluctuations and shorter gaps at high wind speeds. And when you're laterally displaced, so you're not directly downwind from the source, but you're standing to the side of the other source, um, you see much longer pockets of clean air interspersed with rapid hits at high wind speed. So we can play the same game you know, in our minds when we think about efficient codes um, by generating predictions in time rather than based in predictions in space. So we imagine an odor, stim you know, an odor stimulus or any kind of stimulus in time. Here is the step function. Um, if we just want to encode deviations from prediction and the prediction is based on recent history, um, then the function you want to apply is a differentiating function, um, whose linear filter I've described up here. You weight all points in time based on this function. So you give things that occurred recently a positive weight and things that occurred some time ago a negative weight. If you sum points in time after weighting them, um, and then use that as the input to the neuron's input-output function, uh, what you get is something like the differential in time of the input wave, right? And the idea is, again, because you encode deviations from a prediction um, rather than the absolute level of the signal, the absolute magnitude of signals you transmit is smaller than it would be otherwise, and that allows you to encode uh, the world more sensitively. So the idea, you know, I just want to show you that we see kind of interesting dynamics in neuron single factory system that are reminiscent of these ideas. So um, we're just presenting here square pulses of odor in time. At the top, I'm showing you responses of olfactory receptor neurons. These are just some arbitrary examples I picked out. Different odors, different receptor neurons. They turn on with the odor, then they turn off. But if you look at the second order neurons, you see the responses are more transient. So they have a peak that rapidly accommodates. right? And you'll also notice at odor offset that firing is suppressed. So it looks quite a lot like the um, something like, not quite the first derivative in time, some partial derivative in time. Right? And here you see a neuron whose response is um, actually it's inhibited by the odor rather than being turned on. And this neuron shows sort of an on-off dynamics. And again, you see these dynamics arising primarily at the level of second order neurons rather than at the level of the receptor neurons, suggesting they have something to do with connectivity within the brain. Um, and we can use the same game of using private and public odors to ask whether or not the level of activity among these um, inhibitory interneurons is changing the dynamics of the response. So here we're looking at um, firing rate in time in response to a pulse of odor when we have only a private odor present. But now if we add the public odor and you present it at the same time that we present the um, private odor, the public odor tends to make the response more transient. And if we scale these responses to the same peak, that's very clear, right? So driving activity in the network um, tends to make responses more transient. Again, more, more akin to a code encoding change in time rather than the maintained state <coughs> of the stimulus. So I just want to show you my last data slide, which is that we've begun to investigate this at the level of spiking in the inhibitory interneurons themselves. And what we see is this kind of remarkable diversity in their temporal selectivity. So many of these inhibitory interneurons, they look, they look boring, right? They go to all the merry lives. Well, how could that be interesting? Turns out they have specializations, but in the time domain. So here we're presenting fluctuating stimuli, either brief pulses fluctuating rapidly on the left, or else these um, long pulses uh, turning on and off slowly on the right, akin to fast and slow wind speeds in the environment. Right? The first cell is inhibitory interneuron, and it's um, sort of uh, able to track these rapid fluctuations and responds transiently at the onset of these long pulses. The second cell is also an inhibitory interneuron, um, but it seems to be um, specifically adapted to encoding these slow fluctuations, so stimuli with long correlation time. Um, the th third cell on the bottom is also an inhibitory interneuron, but it's responding selectively to odor turning off. Right? And so what we are starting to investigate is the question of whether interneurons are diverse and specialized, not so much with respect to which glomeruli they innervate, but rather which was with respect to what patterns in time, what correlation times they detect, all right? And what profile of statistical regularities in the time domain is best at driving them. Okay, so I'm just gonna um, close um, by uh, kind of telling you a few of the big take-home messages we think that global inhibition in the olfactory system may be an adaptation to wide variations in natural odor intensity because it tends to just control for the fact that as odor concentrations rise, they tend to recruit um, more or less all receptor neurons in an orderly and systematic fashion. And what you want to do is keep neurons within 
um, a narrow dynamic range, and so all, all global inhibition is useful for that. Um, I would argue that nonspecific inhibition suggests that the brain is not predicting statistical regularities in the chemical domain. In fact, there may not be strong statistical regularities in the chemical domain in the world, um, in the way there is in vision, for example. Um, I would argue that turbulent airflow creates statistical regularities in the time domain that organisms should care about. Um, it contains really relevant information um, about the location of an odor source rel relative to the organism. And finally, we would speculate that distinct temporal channels of inhibition rather than spatial channels um, may match the statistics <coughs> of odors um, in the sense that they match the statistics of turbulence. So the last slide I'm going to show you is just the names and faces of my colleagues in the laboratory who um, did the, the work that uh, I've told you about that did come from my lab. In particular, I showed you data from Betty Hong and Kathy Nagel, who are current postdocs in the lab, and some data from some recent lab alumni um, called Bikas Bandawad and Sean Olson. Thank you.